Hello and welcome to the second part of my Wii U retrospective. If you haven't seen part one then it should be like there somewhere in the little eye area so just give that a click. If you have seen part one then great. Today we are going to be reviewing all 31 of the games which came out at launch for the Wii U. Okay let's start off with Nintendo Land. If you bought the premium 32GB black Wii U then this game came bundled in with the console. Nintendo Land is a mini game collection which does a pretty good job of showing off all the new features of the Wii U and all the different ways you can play games on this thing. One thing I don't like about this game however is how several of the mini games will stick a live feed of your slouched head all covered in crumbs. I'm not here to be reminded of the mess that I've now become okay game. Don't judge me. The game has 12 mini games so let's start going through them. Donkey Kong's Crash Course is a lot like that game Screwball Scramble, but you tilt the gamepad to make it work. It can be pretty frustrating when you get near the end of the course and get a game over, meaning you have to start all the way over from the beginning, but it's really fun competing with your friends to see who can get the furthest in the shortest time. The Legend of Zelda Battle Quest is kind of what Skyward Sword should have been. You swing the Wiimote around and kill enemies, or you use the gamepad to aim and fire arrows at the enemies, and wow! I've only done the first level and I've already got the Triforce. That was relatively easy compared to most other Zelda games. Pikmin Adventure is basically just a worse version of Pikmin, so it's probably my favourite mini game here. I really like Pikmin. You go around and you throw the Pikmin at monsters to fight them or collect stuff and it's just a really basic version of Pikmin, meaning that it's still really good. Captain Falcon's Twister Race makes good use of asymmetrical multiplayer, as in it you're usually looking at the gamepad where you steer the game from a top down angle, but sometimes if you go into a tunnel you need to look at the TV to get a different view. This can feel a bit gimmicky, but I guess that's what this whole game is. So this one's at least a good gimmick. Metroid Blast is a game where you move around and shoot stuff. You use the gamepad to aim and this was a problem I found in many of the minigames, but here it was the absolute worst. The gamepad would become uncalibrated and I'd be aiming but it'd be a different direction on the screen. I feel that gyroscopic aiming only works well in small bursts, like where you aim in Ocarina of Time 3DS, but it can't really sustain a full experience because after a few seconds it does just become uncalibrated and you have to wave your controller around wildly trying to figure out where you need to be. Yoshi's Fruit Cart, there's some fruit on the TV but not on your gamepad. So you have to trace a route on your gamepad where you think the fruit is and it's fun for about 30 seconds. Octopus Dance, you move the analog sticks in time with the diver. Bad game, didn't like this one. Takamaru's Ninja Castle is a game where you throw ninja stars at the TV. It works surprisingly well and was a fun shooting gallery type experience. In Balloon Trip Breeze you swipe on your gamepad to blow air at your character in order to move them around. You're mainly looking at the TV with this one, unless you're attacking enemies, in which case you have to also do this while swiping and tapping enemies and changing views, and it all seemed a bit too much at once. Mario Chase is a multiplayer game where the person with the gamepad runs away and the other players try and catch them. This game is incredibly simple, yet it's the one I come back to over and over when I have friends around. It's so simple and yet so fun. Animal Crossing Sweet Day has the player controlling two characters at once with the gamepad, one character is controlled by each analogue stick and they have to hunt down the other players whose job it is to collect fruit. Like Mario Chase it's simple but a great time with friends. Luigi's Ghost Mansion is probably the best use of asymmetrical gaming here as one character controls a ghost which is only visible on the gamepad whilst the other characters have to avoid it using lights. Very fun game. Overall Nintendo Land seems to throw a lot of different gimmicks at you to show off the new hardware. However, the only games which really have much staying power are the multiplayer ones. So this game gets a 6 out of 10. New Super Mario Bros. U is the fourth entry in the new Super Mario Bros. games. So what's new in this one? Um, well, you've got the gamepad now so you can stun enemies and slightly interact with the world by touching the gamepad, but I, I'll be honest, I never really used that feature. You've got the new flying squirrel suit, which is basically just the tanuki suit. There's all the baby Yoshis about, which are just worse versions of previous power-ups. Oh yeah, I know, of course. There's that Van Gogh inspired level. Not world, just one single level. Yeah, there's pretty much nothing new in this game at all. 
when New Super Mario Bros. U came out, there had been three almost identical games before it, with the most recent only coming out a few months before this one. And at least that one had a gimmick of collecting loads of coins, this one just had nothing. There was really no reason to get this game if you had played any of the previous games in the series. I felt burnt out after playing only the first level. At that point I was done with the new Super Mario Bros. games. So obviously I bought and completed it again once it was ported to Switch. Why can't I learn? New Super Mario Bros. U is a good game don't get me wrong, but the series had gotten stale at this point and this just felt like a chore to play then and it was a chore to play again to capture footage for this video. Nintendo needed to give people a reason to buy the new console and they got lazy, releasing a very safe and bland game, which is why I'm only giving it a 6 out of 10. NBA 2K13, executive produced by Jay-Z. Phew, I was worried there for a moment that Jay-Z had had no input on this game. This is another sports game that I know basically nothing about. My knowledge of basketball is mainly from Space Jam, and um... I mean, it's kind of like Space Jam, just without the Looney Tunes or the whimsy. The game plays fine. Probably. I managed to get the ball in the basket, or hoop, as the kids say, which I've heard is a good thing to do in basketball. And the game looks fine, the people look like actual people for the most part, while still being blurry enough that I can pretend they're Michael Jordan, Bill Murray, and the guy from Jurassic Park. Look, my knowledge on these kind of games is very limited, so let's see what the general public thinks. So we are now breaking into people's houses to find out what the general public think about this thing, NBA 2K13 for Wii U. So come on, let's find out. Excuse me, sir, sir, what do you think of what NBA 2K13 for Wii U? Get out, sir, get out, get NBA, out! Get it's out. produced get by Jay-Z, sir. Get out of NBA, my house, I'm calling NBA. the police. Oh, sir, I just, NBA, get out. Get out. Hey, sir, what do you sir, think about you? Fuck off! We you, sir, we you. Get out! We you. NBA. So there we have it. Next up we have Epic Mickey 2, The Power of 2. You see how they mentioned 2 in there twice? Well this game basically doesn't work unless you play in co-op, is what I've learned from playing it. Oswald does all these electrical things and you have very little control over whether he does it or not. Most of the puzzles seem to just be, hope Oswald makes stuff work making it really frustrating. He also does this kind of Rayman hover move where you have to jump onto his legs and that's also incredibly frustrating. I think the main issue with this game is that it's simply not a Wii U game. It's a Wii game and you can tell this because they didn't even change the shape of the B button for it. It runs horrendously as well. It feels like I'm playing it at 75% speed. Actually, I'll tell you exactly what it's like. I used to have the Sony PlayStation Xperia Play phone back in 2011 and one time I downloaded an N64 emulator onto it and my phone did not like the N64 emulator one bit and so when I tried using it to play Majora's Mask it ran in slow motion and it was rubbish and sluggish and very Epic Mickey 2-ish. Apparently the Wii version of this game runs much better, almost as if it should have stayed on the Wii. The gamepad only shows a map, so you're really not missing out on anything. And another reason this game shouldn't be on the Wii U is because the right stick controls the camera and the paintbrush pointer at the same time. So when you start moving the right stick, it only moves the pointer until you move it enough to finally make the camera move, making it feel even more delayed and slow. Almost as if this game was made for pointer controls. The game is just not fun to control at all and the level design on top of that is confusing and ugly and you can't even tell what's paintable and thinnable so you just spray everything but you have a limited amount of both and it's just not very good. It's getting a 3 out of 10. Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed is a sequel to Sonic and All Stars Racing, you know, the one where they didn't transform. In this game the gimmick is that the car can transform into either a boat or a plane depending on the area you're racing in. Huh. I wonder where they got that idea from. Huh. I wonder where they got that idea from. Huh. I wonder where they... No wait, that was the last one. The controls for all of these seem to feel far more slippery than other kart racers I've played, and this might be because it's technically not a kart racer. They're all racing in cars, well, sometimes boats and planes too, but not carts, and that's why it feels more akin to something like Ridge Racer or Forza than a traditional kart racer. The character selection was pretty good, with a lot of legacy Sega characters, and my personal favourite, Wreck-It Ralph. 
However, there weren't really any console exclusive characters like in the first game, unless of course you played the PC version, which for some reason got loads of extra characters. Races often change depending on the lap you're on, with the final lap of many races taking place in the sky or sea. In fact, often the racetrack is just one long course, similar to something like Mount Wario. The constantly changing tracks and the colourful and unique environments they're in often make it feel like you're driving through a theme park ride rather than a racetrack. However, this can make it more difficult to learn the tracks and I sometimes found myself getting lost and going the wrong way during the flying or boating parts as they felt a little bit too open. The game also has a mission mode which does a great job at improving your driving skills and making good use out of the tracks. It's a great single player edition that can be severely lacking in other racing games. Obviously not mentioning any names. And I gotta say, I personally found the game pretty difficult. I was struggling to win races even on medium difficulty, so this really isn't a super easy kid friendly racer. This ain't no race with Ryan, this is a kart racer for real men, or women, or however you identify yourself. But it could just be all my years of playing Mario Kart and Crash Team Racing has destroyed any ability to learn new racing mechanics. I'm sure that if I dedicated a lot of time to this game and learnt the controls and tracks better, I'd really get into it. But I have another 26 games to get through, so for now it's getting a 6 out of 10. Funky Barn is a game I didn't expect to like nearly as much as I did. It's a basic farming simulator type game where you start off with a single chicken and slowly make more money to expand your farm with new tools and equipment and animals like sheep and cows and pigs. And I ended up playing this game for way longer than I intended, as every time I thought, okay, I'm done now, I then thought, well, maybe I could just sell a little bit more wool and then I can afford a larger water trough, and so on for like two hours. It's just really addictive. It also implements the gamepad quite well, as you can play the entire game through touch controls, however, I was still mostly using the directional pads to move a cursor around the screen but the gamepad is certainly great for menus and things like that. Like, Funky Barn is obviously not an amazing game, just look at it. But it's a pretty damn good game for what it is. It really caught me off guard, and it might be due to my lowered expectations, but I'm going to give Funky Barn a 7 out of 10. In fact, it put me in the mood to do some farming of my own. Batman Arkham Asylum Armored Edition. I've heard this is the best way to play this game as the gamepad functionality is really good, so really looking forward to giving this one a go. Okay, so we start out as Catwoman and the combat feels really good, kind of like the Spider-Man games and... oh. Oh. Well, I um, actually had a bit planned for this, but um, it was going to be quite good, it was, we were going to... doesn't matter. Ben 10 Omniverse. It's a beat em up where you play as Ben 10. I never watched Ben 10 when I was growing up, mainly because nine year old me saw it as a cynical ploy to sell toys. And whilst I've heard the show is actually quite good, it's still not not a cynical ploy to sell toys. I remember going to Toys R Us when I was young and counting the number of Ben 10 toys that littered the now Ben 10 aisle at Toys R Us and seeing that there was now more than 10 different characters that Ben 10 could turn into. And believe me, nine year old me felt pretty smug seeing that whilst holding armfuls of Yu-Gi-Oh cards and Doctor Who figures. Those fat cats weren't getting any of my money. They were getting my mum's. Anyway, talking about Ben 10 Omniverse, I remember getting lost in this one a lot. Like I would end up taking out all the enemies and then there'd be no indication of where to go so I would just walk back and forth, occasionally breaking things, trying different monsters to no avail. And I wasn't going to look up a walkthrough for Ben 10 Omniverse because, I mean, I'm an adult. So I would just keep trying things and eventually work out one specific alien had to use one specific move in one specific spot which hadn't been taught to me. This game does a lot of just throwing you in at the deep end and expects you to work out what it is you're supposed to do, what each alien does, and just what exactly is going on here. Also, one thing about the game which really annoyed me is that you have a meter that depletes when you transform into any of the aliens, and then you end up turning back into Ben 10, whose attacks are just terrible and pointless. So you just have to run away and wait until the meter charges up again so you can use another alien. Like, why didn't they just make the meter run out for each individual alien, thereby incentivizing you to swap between the different characters? But no, instead it just incentivizes you to hide and wait. 
this game's getting a three out of ten. Tank, tank, tank is a um. Well, it's a game about tanks. You drive a tank and you kill robots. The game consists of relatively short missions where you drive a tank and um kill robots. Sometimes there's lots of robots to kill. Sometimes there's only one or two. I feel like just seeing a moment of gameplay will tell you everything you need to know about this game. You drive a tank and you kill robots. The controls for the game aren't great, it's basic tank controls where you have to slowly spin around to move, which in the timed missions can be extremely frustrating. Also, I don't know if I've made this clear or not, but the game is mind-numbingly repetitive. I mean, you drive a tank and you kill robots. Over and over and over again. I only played the game for 20 minutes, but after the first five, I was ready to quit. I've not really got much to say about this one. It's bland and you drive a tank, you kill robots. It's getting a 4 out of 10. Next up is Transformers Prime. Here as we boot up the game, we're treated to not the best looking cutscene. And then we're into the game. There's both a single player and a multiplayer, which is nice. So let's start single player and... Well, um, I actually had a bit planned for this. It was with Transformers and it was going to all go... Doesn't matter anymore. You, yeah, but you'll still dress like the Joker. You don't need to dress like the Transformer for this bit. We've done this before, haven't we? Well, I mean, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of different costumes, you know. I... Yeah, but surely there was something you could have done. This is kind of like cutting costs, isn't it? Well, Just well, we're doing the same well, bit. You know, I'm expensive a Transformers outfit a bit. What, well, like, will transform me into a car. I'm, I mean, I'm not monetized. Yeah, but I, I don't, I'm in the same boat. I don't know how much that would cost either, but... Well, then why bring it up, you know? Well, because I would have thought you... a costume. But wouldn't you have thought about it, though? I'm not... I'm, I'm trying, yeah? Well, I'm trying so to watch these videos. And just... No, no. Marvel Avengers Battle for Earth is a fighting game that takes place in a third-person perspective. Meaning, even if you play two-player, you have to have split-screen. Which I just found weird for a fighting game. Is that normal? I, I don't really play fighting games. Also, the game doesn't even require the gamepad. Which, for a launch title intended to showcase the new console, also just confused me. So, the game has like 20 characters from the Marvel Universe to play as, and the gameplay is pretty bland. I'd just move around in a circle and press some buttons, hoping they'd do a good attack. Also, the game doesn't really have a story mode as such. There's a really long opening cutscene which tries to justify why all the Marvel characters are fighting, but then you get into it, and there's just a tournament mode and a few challenges to keep you busy if you're playing alone. It really just feels like a bare bones fighting game, and I don't really care for fighting games, and this game definitely hasn't changed my mind. I give it a 2 out of 10. I mean, the disc at least worked, so that's something in its favour. Zombie U is one of the games I received with my original Wii U. It's a first person game where you run around the back streets of London, often armed with just a cricket bat. If you die, you stay dead and become a new character tasked with hunting down your previous character and killing them in order to get back your supplies. In theory, this sounds like a fun and original idea. However, in practice, you in fact get respawned back at your base, which makes it feel like padding and an overly long process to get back to where you were. I feel like games like Hollow Knight did this concept way better as it still included checkpoints, which you would return to if you died. The game does make great use of the gamepad, you can really tell that Ubisoft had high hopes for the Wii U. There are plenty of instances where you'll be typing in door codes on the gamepad whilst checking back on the TV to see if any zombies are coming. It's honestly hard to imagine this game being possible on any other console, never mind. The game as a whole is pretty good. We have multiplayer again utilising the gamepad with great effect, where one player can place zombies anywhere they like on the map, whilst the other player fights them off. One complaint I did have with the game though, is that wielding the bat does feel a bit clunky and slow, but I guess that's kind of a point of it. I just found that any other weapon or ammo were too scarcely littered through the levels for them to really be a viable alternative. So I'd end up trying to save my bullets and stick to just using the bat, then get killed and lose everything anyway. I'm giving Zombie U a 6 out of 10. Mass Effect 3. Mass Effect is a series that I've never actually played before. And before I begin, they're already offering me a comic to read to provide some backstory. The lore for this game does seem a bit too deep, 
for something I'm going to play for 20 minutes and give an ill-informed review on. So um, let's just skip the comic for now. When I started properly playing the game, there was very little actual playing going on, as most of the time was spent watching endless cutscenes. However, that's clearly Keith David voice in this guy, so I'll allow it. The cutscenes in this game include dialogue options, and like most games which have this, there's two options. The, sure, that sounds good, I'm nice option, or the, I'm a knobhead option. The gameplay does feel pretty good to control, and whilst aiming the gun, it shows your enemies health, which I've never seen in a third person action game before, but I really liked it, it was super helpful. From the small amount of the game that I played, I really did enjoy it, and I know I shouldn't start at free and only play up to the title sequence, so this game is going to get a, I'd almost certainly really enjoy it if I played the Mass Effect games properly, maybe I should get Mass Effect Legendary Edition and play them all. Wait, it's not on Switch? Fine, I suppose I could get it on PlayStation. How long would it actually take to play though? What does it say on howlongtobeat.com? 106 hours? Well that's not happening. Out of 10. Madden 13. This game was never actually released in Power Regions, so I had to get a copy imported from America. But then there was another problem. Nintendo region locked the Wii U, presumably to stop people from playing Madden. So I had to mod my Wii U and extract the data from the disc in order to bypass the region lock. All so that I can play Madden 13. And finally, after hours of trying, I eventually started playing the game and I realised that I know even less about American football than I did about basketball. There's not one educational Looney Tunes movie about American football and believe me, I've checked. See, American football isn't really played in the UK, that place where what I'm from, you know, crumpets and that. And that's probably the reason this game was never actually released here. Okay, so I'll pick the Eagles, as I've heard that one mentioned in Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and yep, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just jabbing random plays on the gamepad and hoping stuff happens. I didn't do well. But you know who probably does know more about sports than I do? The general public. So we are now in people's houses asking members of the public what they think of this thing. Madden 13 on Wii U. So come on. Excuse me, sir. What do you think of Madden Wii U? What are you doing in my house? What, Madden, Madden Wii U? Madden, Madden, Madden 13 on Wii U? Oh, what's your opinion? Yes, sir, sir, sir. So there we have it. Sports Connection, or ESPN Sports Connection, depending on your region. This is Ubisoft's attempt at filling the void of a Wii Sports for Wii U. There are six sports here, tennis, golf, baseball, football, racing, and football again, but the American kind. So first off, when navigating the menus, there's like a two second delay when I select anything. Sometimes the gamepad has broken white lines appearing on the border of the screen, and the whole game just runs at about 10 frames per second. On top of that, there's also really noticeable massive delays on any kind of input while playing the game. As a whole, this game simply feels like it's struggling to run at times, and I mean, just look at it. I don't see how this can be pushing the limits of the system. So let's start by looking at tennis. This can be played with either the touchscreen or by swinging a Wiimote. The game was fine, just basically a Wii Sports clone, just nothing special. Next up is baseball, and this one had a lot of swapping between controls. You have to swap between touchscreen controls to gyro aiming to swinging a Wiimote, all in a matter of seconds. And that made the game pretty confusing. Also, the delay in registering the Wiimote swings is most noticeable here, as in something like baseball, where the timing is quite important, it's not great to have a delay. So it meant that I had to swing earlier than I usually would in order to account for the delay. As for the other sports, racing was meh, football was meh, football was bad, golf was okay. There were moments where I was nearly having fun, but I think that's just because something like golf, even at its worst form, is still kind of fun. So I give this game a 3 out of 10. Next up we have Family Party 30 Great Games Obstacle Arcade, which I seemingly don't need to review as the game has already reviewed itself. They're great games apparently, so that's put my mind at rest. So this game is another mini game collection. Think Mario Party without the boards, or mini games that, you know, actually work properly. There was a lot of switching between controls in this game. Again, this was during the time when companies were still figuring out how the gamepad was going to be used. So mostly the Wii U gamepad is kind of just used as a pause menu that's always open while you're off waggling a Wiimote. 
often the gamepad is only used to give instructions on how to play the game. Instructions that aren't particularly clear. They'll tell you vaguely what you have to do, but not whether it's touchscreen controls or gyroscope controls or buttons or pointing at the screen. That part you seemingly have to figure out on your own. As for the actual mini games, do I really need to say it? They're not great. The game lied to me. They're bad. They go on too long and sometimes they just don't work. And as such, this game is getting a 2 out of 10. Next up we have Game Party, another mini game collection trying to fill that Wii Sports void. This game has a story mode which massively surprised me. I had high hopes for it as it began. There was voiceover and cutscenes. And your character is awkwardly silent and non-responsive in any of these conversations and... And hey, you know what? I know it was tough growing up without a dad. That had to have sucked, but I'm tired of the mopey attitude. Jeez, alright, keep it light game party. Remember, you are just a minigame collection. So then after that weird bombshell, you play some air hockey, which was fine. You use the touchscreen to control it and it works well enough. Then you go to the arcade and you can select some more minigames. There's a football minigame where you have to hold the gamepad long ways to aim and throw balls at targets, which was fun for about 10 seconds until the gamepad became uncalibrated. You have to press the X button in order to recenter the gamepad, which while I'm using the touchscreen and holding the gamepad weirdly, isn't really the easiest thing to do. There was a basketball minigame which was just impossible as I couldn't control the flicks to make the balls move the correct distance. And then ping pong, which was the absolute worst. You don't see a bat on the TV or gamepad, so you just have to blindly tap the gamepad where you think the ball is. And you can't see the ball on the gamepad, so you just have to stab at the gamepad blindly. And oh my god, did I hate this one. The game does have four more mini games, but to be honest, these ones were making me actually angry, so I had to stop. Game Party gets a 1 out of 10. So I've been working on this video for like a month now and it's so draining and exhausting and I haven't slept in days and I've started hearing things. Where's that music coming from? If oh. you'd like, we can play a game or I could go away. Yes, go, go away. But if Play a game, we could play it all day. No, look, I really don't have time for this weird Muppet song. I've got work to do, okay? Hello, Danny. Look, I'm here too. I want to come and play with you. Invite me to the party. I'm getting sad on my own over there. What are you talking about? There's no party, there's no Muppet songs. I'm just trying to work. We could play. NBA 2K13. That that part didn't rhyme, but that's that. Or Zombie You or Epic Mickey 2. They're both on Wii U. Call of Duty Black Ops 2, which is a solid port for the most part. It's probably the best looking launch title on Wii U although the frame rate can be pretty bad at times as a result. But yeah, it's still a full, proper Call of Duty game with seemingly little sacrifice despite it being on a Nintendo console. The game doesn't really have any gamepad functionality apart from playing on the gamepad screen and some very basic options. It's just a pretty basic port of the game with no bells or whistles. And from what I played, the game is good. There's a good variety of missions with some stealth missions, a lot more than just the standard mindlessly shoot everything gameplay that the series has now become known for. Also, it includes zombies, which is by far the best thing about any Call of Duty game. So you know what, this game's fine, it's, it's alright, it gets a 5 out of 10. Ninja Gaiden 3 is pretty fun. It's what Ben 10 Omniverse should have been. It's a pretty standard button masher beat em up with a heavy emphasis on the button mashing. I feel I could have just got one of those drinking birds to press the Y button over and over and it would probably be as good as I was at the game. I found that the game didn't perform brilliantly, there was a fair bit of slowdown when I first booted up the game, but then after that it seemed to run relatively smoothly. So this game is a beat em up. You beat some people up, you move to a new area, you beat some more people up. Also this game really likes using the vibration feature of the gamepad, like a lot. It felt like the gamepad just kept vibrating for whole minutes at a time at some points. 
Also, the game is set in London, and oh look, I've been there. I probably won't be returning to this game anytime soon, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't enjoy this one. So I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. Warriors Orochi 3 Hyper. Now this is more like it. If you're going to have a button masher, at least make me incredibly overpowered. Now, with your usual button masher beat-em-up games, I find I have to press the same button over and over and over again to finally kill an enemy. Whereas in the Warriors game, every single tap of a button takes out like 50 enemies, and that's a lot of dopamine being shot into my brain right there. This game, however, did lack a lot of features which I like in the later Warriors games, like it doesn't have the dodge ability, which was a bit annoying as I pretty much use that exclusively rather than blocking. It also lacks the ability to have characters you control go to different areas independent of you. So if there's something you've missed on the other side of a map, you're going to need to go for a pretty long walk instead of just telling another character to go to that area and then swapping to that character once they've arrived. So the basic idea of this game is you go around, you take out hundreds of enemies at a time across a large map and you capture some keeps and do some missions. Each level usually culminates in a boss. This was one of a few games on the list that didn't feel like a chore to play, so it's getting a 7 out of 10. So FIFA 13 is the only FIFA game on Wii U. This would be the third game EA had on launch day, the others being Madden and Mass Effect that we've already talked about. They'd release Need for Speed a few months later, then abandon all support for the Wii U entirely. We can't wait to see EA games on this new system. Here it's a pretty standard affair. I... I assume. Again, sports games really aren't my thing. It did utilise the gamepad though, with features like gyroscopic aiming for penalties and easily managing positions of players. There are, however, also some bad uses of the Wii U gamepad, like touching to tackle and shaking the gamepad to shoot, which I really can't imagine anyone ever used. The game was also called FIFA 13, not FIFA 13 Legacy Edition, the kind of Legacy Edition games we get nowadays, which is just code for we didn't try. So here's just last year's game repackaged, or you know, maybe even the year before that. I really don't have much to say about this game, so once again, let's ask the public what they think. Yeah, it's definitely asleep. So we are still in people's houses, finding out what members of the public think about this thing. FIFA 13 for Wii U. So come on, let's find out. Sir, 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 excuse me. What do you think about FIFA 13 for Wii U? So it utilises the gamepad quite well. What's your opinions? Sir? So, 5 out of 10. I'd say average. This is where we have it. Tekken Tag Tournament 2 Wii U Edition. So it's a fighting game, a genre I'm not massively into. So I'm kind of going into this game a bit blind. Okay, there's a pretty big roster of characters, which is nice, but I couldn't seem to find Chun Li anywhere, so I guess I'll just be this kangaroo guy. And playing it, I gotta say, it's actually a very good fighting game, both easy to play and complex to master. And it just feels really nice to control. The Wii U version of this game is absolutely the definitive edition, as every character has their own Nintendo costume. Niche characters too, like Captain Falcon and Star Fox. I don't like fighting games as I usually find them too nothingy, but this one was one of the better ones, so I give it a 7 out of 10. Assassin's Creed 3 this is a very average AAA game. It has everything you'd expect from a game like this. There's lots of fun set pieces and that fluid free-running movement that all AAA games seem to have around this time. Tomb Raider, Uncharted. If you like climbing, then it's a fine choice for a launch title. Although there were a few frame rate issues and you can tell the game doesn't like being on Wii U. The gamepad mainly just shows a map, which is really what most games would ultimately end up using the gamepad for. So you'd probably be better off playing this game on a more powerful console. Also, in this game, so much of your time is spent watching a cutscene, then slowly following someone around as they endlessly ramble on, then watching another cutscene, then slowly walking towards a green dot, then watching another cutscene, and it can get incredibly tedious. This might just be the most meh AAA game I've ever played. So this game is going to get a 4 out of 10.
Skylanders Giants. I'm not going to go too deeply into this one as I'm planning on talking about this more when I get to talking about Amiibos and all the NFC Wii U stuff. But Skylanders Giants is the sequel to Skylanders Spyro's Adventure. The game where you place figures on a portal to play as them in the game. This time the gimmick is that the toys are slightly bigger. Meaning that sure, you could use your old Skylanders figures, but now they're smaller and worse in the game. And you know, just buy the new better figures, okay? So if you can get past the shady business of charging nearly £500 to unlock all the game's content, then it's a fun beat-em-up puzzle game. Although the characters do lack the ability to jump, which always irritated me. It's pleasant, it's fun, and if you can get past the constant advertisements to buy the new toys, then there's a good chance you're going to enjoy it. So I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. You need this! What is it? It's your shape! Fitness Evolved 2013 for Wii U! We can get you in shape! Your shape Fitness Evolved 2013. Imagine if you took Wii Fit, removed the balance board, removed all the personality from the game, and what you'd be left with is your shape Fitness Evolved 2013. The game seems to go out of its way to tout itself as a more professional fitness plan, yet most of the modes just involve you dancing or learning dance moves. There is one other mode which does seem to focus more on traditional exercises. Here we are doing the ab toner exercise. I can't deal with this. <laughs> this is awful. It's I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> For the most part, the game does seem to play like a bad knockoff of Just Dance, with only five songs available. The game also doesn't do a great job of tracking your movements. It's one of those games where you can just wiggle the Wiimote and the game will think you're doing a good job. In all honesty, it's barely even a game. This could easily have been a DVD, and there'd be pretty much no difference at all. I'm giving Your Shape Fitness of Old 2013 a 1 out of 10. Just Dance 4. You do need a Wii Remote for this one, so if you've just got the new Wii U console and this game, you better head back to the shop. Well, actually you can use the gamepad's microphone to sing into to get some extra points, but what I found is it mostly just picks up the sound from the TV and thinks you're a great singer, which was a nice confidence boost. There's also the feature to draw on the gamepad during dances, which I didn't actually find out about until I looked back through the game footage. So everyone knows the basic idea of Just Dance. You hold the Wiimote and perform the dance moves in time with the weird looking Stay Puft Marshmallow dancers. The Just Dance games live or die by what songs they've included, and here's the complete list of them. I personally thought there was enough there which I recognised, so it was a pretty good experience. And the game can actually be a pretty good workout at times. I kept having to take breaks because I was getting so exhausted. <coughs> you don't you don't sound alright. Huh? You don't sound huh? like, You're bleeding. What? You're bleeding. Where? Where? Out your nose. Huh? Out your nose. Oh, you're um. <coughs> what have you what's it? I'll give this game a five out of ten. Well, now that's done, I guess I'll never have to touch a Just Dance game again. There are eight more Just Dance games on Wii U. So, for my review of Sing Party, I wanted to include it here, but Carly Rae Jepsen's lawyers are threatened to break my legs. So, it's in its own special little video. So, it should be in the little eye icon somewhere. So, if you just click on that, then you can watch that video. Scribble Noughts Unlimited is a game where you type something into it, and that thing then appears in the game and then you have to use these things to complete objectives. When I had the original Scribblenauts game on DS, I'd never even play the actual game. I'd just mess about on the start screen, making different things appear. It always amazed me just how much effort went into creating basically any object I could think of. Like someone had to draw and animate that peacock. As you can make basically anything, the game is as fun as your own imagination will allow. So it wasn't great for me, as the best thing I could think of to give this hungry man was some big cheese. Or for this one, I needed to put someone in the phone box to create a sidekick for the superhero. I wrote boy, really pushing the boat out for that one. As this is the Wii U version of this game, you can have Nintendo characters like Mario and Bowser, and Bowser just destroyed Mario with ease. I had to make a band for this guy, so obviously we'll put Link on the ocarina. This beggar wants to learn a new skill to earn money. 
look, man, you don't need to learn a new skill. Just, just take this and put this on. The game says that it doesn't allow vulgarity, copyrighted materials, or proper nouns, which is basically all the stuff you try first. Can't have poo? What kind of game is this? So I can have a holy potato, but can't have a satanic potato? Uh, picking sides a bit, are you scribble noughts? Actually, I can have Satan, and he's not a nice Satan. Look, I'll put an angry lemon next to him, and Satan just annihilates it. This game is really fun, especially if you have other people to help come up with ideas. This game gets a 7 out of 10. Wipeout 3 is another game that was never released in PAL regions, so I again had to try and extract the data from the disc to play it, but then every time I tried to boot the game up, it would just freeze immediately. And I mean sure, I could buy a replacement disc from America, but then I'd have to delay this video for ages, and I'm not putting that Joker makeup back on because it gave me this weird rash on my face, I think I was allergic to it. Look, I've reviewed a lot of games, I'm pretty burnt out. So here's some stock reactions I put over some footage of the game I found on YouTube. Ooh, wow. That looks good, slash bad. I really liked slash hated this game. I'm giving this game a number out of 10. Rabbids Land is a solid party game. It's basically a Mario Party clone, but seeing as what we eventually got on Wii U in terms of Mario Party, this might in fact be the better option. Rabbids Land involves you going around a board trying to collect trophies, which you can win by landing on a specific space, completing challenges, or competing in mini-games. The mini-games are great, utilising the gamepad to great effect. Except the one where you have to blow penguins at a pirate ship, I went so lightheaded doing that one. I mean, I won the mini-game, sure, but at what cost? <coughs> what have you, what's it? I've played the game a few times with friends, and there doesn't seem to be a huge variety of mini-games, as we would end up playing the same mini-games over and over. But the few mini games that this game does have are good, and I'm giving this game a 7 out of 10. Okay, and now we're on to our final game, Darksiders 2, which came out five years before Darksiders 1 on Wii U. So let's get into it and ah! And you know what the worst thing is? This isn't even my only copy of Darksiders 2. I bought two copies of this game and neither one worked. In fact, so many of these games I bought just don't work and I just have to return them or, I don't know, use them as bedding for some kind of animal. I, you know what? If you're going to invest in Wii U games or just buy any Wii U game, make sure that you check it works immediately. So that's it. That was everything the Wii U had to offer on launch day. I feel none of these games were particularly great. I think the highest I gave a game was a 7, and certainly none of these were must-have games that you just had to go out and buy a Wii U for. It was mostly filled with low-effort shovelware, ports of games better suited on other consoles, or even new experiences that felt too gimmicky and too complicated for their own good. Let's see if Nintendo can put out some better games in the rest of the Wii U's first year on the market. Spoiler, uh, they do not. And that's it. 31 Wii U games down. 149 left to play. Thank you so much for getting all the way to the end of this video. I mean, you even got through that weird puppet bit in the middle, so I'm very impressed with that. If you enjoyed this video, then please give me a like or write a comment or subscribe if you want to see the next part of this Wii U retrospective where I look at probably another load of games. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.